Today, we're going to talk about pesticides in further detail. In particular, we're going to focus on the application methods, the techniques, and the types of equipment that are used to apply pesticides. We'll cover a little bit of the theory behind them and how to select them properly, but all of the safety and the storage requirements and the laws and regulations will be in another lecture. It's very important that uh, you don't just listen to this one lecture and go out and start spray, spray, spray. You really need to understand the big picture, the entire uh, story with pesticides and uh, their safe use in order to make good decisions. But here we're gonna focus on application techniques and equipment. So here we go with our lecture of the day, pesticide equipment and application techniques. As a recap, pesticides are chemicals that kill, prevent, or repel pests and reduce pest damage. Correct pesticide, correct application, and correct timing are important to the success of control. Remember, we can further break down this definition of pesticides as we would further divide the category of a pest. So you could have an insecticide, something that goes after an insect pest. You can have a fungicide, something that goes after a fungus. You can have a rodenticide, something that goes after uh, a rodent pest, and you can have an herbicide, something that goes after a weed. Those are just some of the names applied to various types of pesticides. They're all pesticides because they're designed to control for pests, and primarily it's meant to kill, but it could also be for preventing or repelling, and overall reducing their damage. So when you're deciding if you want to use a pesticide, of course, remember our IPM hierarchy and the fact that chemical control would be at the very top of that pyramid. We would try to use other methods first, if at all possible. And mainly we can sum it up with the statement of be sure you need it. Make sure that you absolutely need a pesticide if you're going to apply it. What does that mean? means you need to ask yourself, is a pest really causing your problem? Could the problem be caused by something else? Is the pesticide application warranted? Is there another way to deal with a pest? Is it the right time to apply a pesticide? And when we talk about time, we're talking about the time of year as it relates to the life cycle of the organism and also the time of day and the local weather conditions. And then you wanna see if non-pesticide tactics can contribute to control. Maybe you need some pesticide, but how are you going to also bring in some prevention techniques or some other methods to limit your requirement of chemical control? Additionally, you need to be careful in how you identify your pest so that way you can select the appropriate chemical. When you have your chemical selected, you need to read the label. The label has very important information, safety information, application information, storage information. All of that needs to be known before you uh, select the pesticide and certainly before you apply it. You wanna make sure that the host plant and the application location is listed on the label or that the chemical is appropriate for the use uh, of the plant you're trying to protect as well as for the organism you're targeting and the location where, you're list where you are. Give a second thought to those uh, pesticides that you may be applying to edible plants and how that might relate to the future palatability of those plants and safety of anyone who may consume the plant. And you always want to choose the least toxic pesticide that will be effective. It's important to purchase only the amount that's necessary to be used within a few months so that you reduce your need to store 
large quantities of chemical pesticides. And then we're considering pesticide selectivity. So remember that we have selective or broad spectrum pesticides. Selective pesticides are those that kill only the target organisms and related species. An example would be Bt, which is a, an organic pesticide that attacks moths and butterfly larvae. You can contrast that with a broad spectrum pesticide, otherwise known as non-selective, because that's one that will kill many species. There's many examples of those, and those would be similar chemicals. They may kill the caterpillars that eat your plants, but they would also potentially go after the natural enemies and many other insects. And so we're always trying to be as selective as possible so that we only target the organism that's actually doing the damage. Now, of course, even the selective pesticide will go after related species. And so you want to be very cautious that going after cabbage moths, for example, doesn't also end up killing the monarchs in your garden. And remember that we want to promote the natural enemies in the landscape. And if we apply pesticides, it can severely disrupt the biological control methods in the garden because predators are often more susceptible to pesticides than the pests. This is because the pests have been sprayed for years and years and years, and they've actually developed some resistance to pesticide, whereas those predators don't necessarily have that same resistance. Additionally, the natural enemies tend to have greater movement throughout the landscape. They're going from plant to plant, usually feeding on pest organisms, which means they have an increased chance of contact with the chemical pesticide. And they need to eat those pests. So if you're applying chemicals to kill all the aphids, then you're not gonna end up having any of the organisms that eat aphids in your garden. So, the idea with IPM is we tolerate that certain level of organism below the action threshold in order to encourage a healthy ecology and therefore bring in the predators of the organisms and let nature do the work for us. So this is one of the reasons chemical control is one of our last resorts. And remember to only go for it when you truly need it because otherwise we're depriving the natural enemies of their chance for food. Pay attention also to potential damage you may cause to the plant you're trying to protect or to non-target plants. You may have a little bit of drift on those herbicides and on a windy day, you think you're spraying the weeds and it blows over next door to a plant that you weren't even thinking about and you may damage or even kill that plant. This is called phytotoxicity. This is when you have chemical damage to plants. It can result from applying too much chemical to the landscape, allowing your spray to drift, lack of proper precautions. If you apply to extra plants, those that weren't necessarily needing the treatment. And even if you have some contamination of your equipment, say you have some leftover chemical from last time, and you're applying it now in a different setting, without your knowledge, you might be spreading something that's harmful to your plants. And remember that environmental stress can increase the effects of phytotoxicity. So when you have drought or you have weakened plants, uh, those are gonna be the ones that succumb sooner to uh, pesticide drift. We need to pay very close attention to protecting waterways and natural uh, riparian habitats. Uh, these can be affected by pesticide contamination. And it's in these riparian habitats where the streams and creeks naturally run. And these tend to run directly into 
the ocean or into the storm drain system, which eventually goes out to the ocean. And we can be impacting wild ecosystems or even impacting future groundwater that can cause damage to human health. So we wanna be very careful to uh, not allow pesticides to get into the environment in this way. So be very cautious about uh, which drains you use to clean your equipment, whether you're using household drains, storm drains, or whether there's any runoff from the landscape. Various chemicals will have various requirements and you need to follow them very carefully. So how do we protect water from becoming contaminated? Well, first, do not apply when it is windy or if rainfall is expected within 48 hours. That's an automatic do not spray time. So if you look at the weather and it's about to rain in the next couple of days, even a small percent chance, do not apply chemical pesticides. Don't apply chemical pesticides to any hard surfaces, such as driveways, gutters, sidewalks, or storm drains, because then when it does rain, or even if there's some irrigation overspray, that is going to run off into the storm drain system. Blow or sweep any granules that land on hard surfaces back into the landscape. Use spot application for broad spectrum pesticides. What this means is don't apply a broad spectrum pesticide across an entire garden. Go find the target organism and spray it directly spot application. Check labels and follow any warnings. Remember the, the label has a lot of information and it's important to read it first and follow it carefully. Never dispose of concentrate or leftover solution in the gutters, storm drains, sinks, or toilets. So what do you do with leftover solution? You only make enough for you to apply that time. So use it all up is the idea. Do not clean mixing and application equipment where rinse water can contaminate waterways. Never apply more than the amount or number of applications listed on the label. So don't add a little extra to make it a little bit more effective. Follow that label carefully. And we need to protect against uh, pesticide drift, which is the overspray in the air, allowing it to uh, go in the air and blow away to a neighboring site. We do that by trying to maximize the droplet size and control droplet air time. So if we're applying in a sprayer, we don't want a fine mist. We want bigger droplets that will fall to the ground quickly and not blow away in the wind. So in order to do this, we make our applications in accordance with the label directions. We want to be aware of any setback distances from nearby susceptible crops, the wind speed, the direction of the wind, and the location of any sensitive crops in your area. Don't spray when wind speeds are over 10 miles per hour. Be extra cautious when humidity is below 50% and when the temperature is high, because this will have a higher tendency for evaporation and pesticide drift. Keep the sprayer as close to the target as possible. So if you're going to spray, be very close. Don't be far away. Make sure you have a very easy application and reduce that cone of spraying to a very small area. Be aware of pesticide resistance as well. Resistance occurs when a pest population is no longer effectively controlled by a pesticide that was previously able to provide control. And there's a diagram here that illustrates how pesticide resistance occurs. So before you apply any pesticides, all organisms have genetic variations and some might have a natural resistance to any given chemical. And we may have one bug out of 10 that has that resistance. So we're going to apply uh, the pesticide. And you can see in that first generation, it kills the vast majority of pests. 
but it leaves behind the one that was resistant and a few that weren't. And now there's a later generation and those that were resistant have survived and therefore they reproduce and that resistance tends to be passed on genetically. And then you apply again another time. And once again, you'll remove those that are not resistant. And over time, through the generations, you will have selected for a population that is resistant to your chemical. So this is why if you're using chemical control, it's very important to rotate chemicals and to rotate control measures. So don't rely on chemicals so much. And if you do need chemicals, switch them around. So that way you're not always going to develop the resistance. And remember, it's not switching the name of the chemical that's important, but it's important to switch the mode of action or the means by which the chemical does the control. If you can rotate modes of action in your chemical selection, you will have a less likelihood to develop resistance. But of course, this is also why we approach this as a last resort strategy. You need to apply pesticides safely. So what that means is that all people who mix, apply, or otherwise handle pesticides at work or as part of their job must be properly trained in advance of each pesticide they use. Employers must maintain written evidence of this training, and the applicator may be required to be DPR licensed, Department of Pesticide Regulations, or have their work supervised by a certified person. This is if you're a professional. If you're a homeowner, uh, private property laws, unfortunately, allow you to do all kinds of things that are illegal if you're a company but people can poison themselves and their land uh, because we protect private property very strongly in this country. However, most residential uh, gardeners are unable to purchase the very strong chemicals. Those strong chemicals that can do the worst damage are usually only available to those people who are licensed and will then be able to apply them effectively as part of a commercial operation. And according to the California Department of Pesticide Regulation, anyone who applies pesticides as part of a landscape maintenance company must be DPR certified, even if they only occasionally apply pesticides. A big part of the training is to understand human safety measures. And a very big important part of that is wearing the proper personal protective equipment, PPE. We've become more familiar with PPE in recent years due to uh, the global pandemic. But these types of uh, equipment that ensure personal safety are just as important for chemical pesticides. In particular, it's important that the applicator wears chemical resistant gloves, eye protection that covers the eyebrows and the temples, a long sleeve shirt, long pants, and closed toe shoes. You can see a chart there that describes different materials of gloves and the different types of chemicals that they will protect you from. Additionally, on the diagram on the right-hand side, you can see where are the hot spots for being exposed. And so the percentage next to those various parts of the human body it indicates the relative amount of absorption of pesticide over a 24 hour period. Notice areas that are even under clothing and normally not exposed to the environment can very easily become exposed to pesticides if proper protective equipment, proper hygiene and sanitary conditions are not maintained. And even if you are not applying pesticides yourself, if you observe, supervise, or hire somebody to apply pesticides for you on your behalf, it's important that you ensure they are following safe procedures because this has the chance to cause extreme harm in the short term as well as 
over a long period of time. So here's an image of what not to do, quite obviously. And unfortunately, the best images of what not to do usually come from outside of the United States. Although I guarantee that if you look closely enough, we find plenty of unsafe practices very close to home as well. When it comes to the application equipment, it's important to mix only as much as you need immediately. Don't make a bunch of extra because then you have to store it or dispose of it safely. So only mix as much as you need. If you are using a sprayer or a piece of application equipment, it's very important that you place a tag on that device. That tag must have the product name, the signal word from the label, which would either be caution, warning, or danger, depending on how severe the chemical is. You need to have your name on the tag and telephone number. This is because if you lose the product, uh, people need to know who to call in order to get you to come and clean it up because you're responsible for that material inside the application equipment. Additionally, if you're found face down with a backpack sprayer on your back and say you've collapsed or fainted, it's important that whoever uh, assists first aid knows what's inside that backpack. It may or may not be related to the reason why the applicator has collapsed, but they need to know that information in order to make sure they stay safe themselves and that any doctors can also be aware of that information to keep you healthy. Any leftover chemical needs to be disposed of at a hazardous waste facility. So let's go through some various types of application equipment, starting from the small to the large. Uh, you can get ready-to-use uh, pesticides. Ready-to-use means there's no dilution required. This is not concentrated. Two common ready-to-use types of equipment would be an aerosol can or a trigger pump sprayer. Both of these are not designed to be diluted or mixed, and usually these are uh, not too concentrated, not too toxic, and meant for sort of the residential application. Even using ready to use, you would need to be licensed if you're doing this as a job. Then there's commercial formulations. Commercial formulations are often concentrated and require special application equipment and certification. Some of the equipment that you would use could be a hose end sprayer. You see the image on the left-hand side. So the chemical goes into the plastic bottle. There's a dial on top that you can control the mixing rate. And then as you uh, depress the trigger from the nozzle, the hose nozzle, water naturally mixes in and it's diluted. There's a compressed air sprayer that can be carried around. You can put anything you like in compressed air sprayers. They're very effective for applying pesticides, but they're also effective for applying other things. So you don't need a certification to purchase this type of equipment. However, if you're gonna have pesticides in it, you certainly do. And then there's a backpack sprayer, which is probably the most common type of uh, commercial application equipment. It's basically a compressed air sprayer that's more ergonomic. You put it on your back, you can carry a larger amount of chemical and you apply the compressed air pressure with a pump in one hand and you have the application wand in the other hand. It's very important that you understand how to mix the chemicals safely when you're applying commercial pesticide, which typically needs to be diluted. You want to mix the material in a plastic tub so that you can pour any spilled chemical back into the sprayer. So you have your sprayer and you do your mixing inside of a tub. So just in case any misses, it will not go on the ground, but it goes into a secondary container and you can reuse that. It's very important that the equipment you use for mixing 
needs to be only used for mixing. Don't also store other things in your mixing container and label it as the pesticide mixing equipment and make sure you store it away from other tools and equipment so that that does not contaminate anything else. Before you put pesticides into the equipment, it's important that you fill the sprayer with clean water and test it before adding pesticides. And when you do so, you can therefore look for any leaking connections, any bulging hoses, or any plugged nozzles. If you don't do this and you put the chemical directly in, then you see that you have a problem. Now you have to deal with it. You need to clean it up. And now you have extra chemical that you don't know what to do with. So first fill your equipment with water, give it a test. And if that works well, then go ahead and continue with the chemical pesticide. When we dilute concentrated pesticides in a commercial application, this is called a tank mix because we're really mixing it right there in the tank where we're applying. And if you're on very large scale pesticide applications, then you may even utilize powered equipment. This could be either in the form of a powered sprayer that's run by a pump, as you can see with the trailer on the left-hand side, or sort of an ATV with a container on the back. That container could be pump-driven or gravity-driven, but the applicator is using a powered tractor or a powered uh, car to drive around to apply the pesticide over a broad area. Now, this is just a general overview of the various types of equipment, the scales, the types of considerations to have when applying pesticides. And obviously, each scenario, each plant, each pest, each garden will have its proper uh, answer for applying chemical pesticides. This is kind of the introduction to what you need to know. Next up, we're going to talk about the laws and the regulations regarding licensure, certification, and safety.